And now I'm excited to introduce my friend and collaborator, uh, Jonathan Dutan, an honorary fellow of the Stanford Compression Forum, who in fact has played a key part in its establishment, as you will glean from perusal of the um, Compression Forum's inaugural workshop website from, from 2015. He researches and lectures on applied strategy and policy for the decentralized web. For the last two years, he's led the creation of the Starling framework for data integrity, which is a comprehensive set of tools and principles that empowers organizations to securely capture, store, and verify human history. I think he's going to give us some ideas of this exciting new framework uh, in this talk. He has many years of experience navigating the intersections of media, tech, and policy. I'll uh, leave you to peruse his bio on the website for more on his impressive achievements, not, not least of which is that he recently wrapped up six seasons writing and producing HBO's Emmy award-winning series, Silicon Valley, which uh, as many of you surely know, data compression has been a central theme. So it's going to be exciting to hear about his vision for the centrality of compression in the context of the Starling Initiative. Take it away, Jonathan. Great, thank you, Tachi. I'll share my screen here and make sure everyone can see it before I begin. Can everyone see the full screen okay? Yeah. Great. Yes. All right, perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to present this case study on the 78 Days project that we just recently completed um, here at Stanford and our partners over at the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, I'm gonna begin with uh, actually some uh, recorded remarks though um, from the president of Stanford and, uh, and a little bit of a peek at his um, remarks from this year's uh, upcoming um, commencement ceremony. My name is uh, Nelson Baghetti and I'm the president of Stanford. Stanford. At first it was really hard to find my office because it's on the second floor but uh, I think I have it down now. You just go upstairs. You graduates have a lot of responsibility, finishing the important work of movements such as Pound, Met Double Zero, and Title X. But I feel sure we are in good hands, for as our motto states, die luft der fright wet, freedom blows. Wait, that can't be right. Um, so uh, obviously this is all in jest. Um, certainly uh, Big Head is not president of Stanford, but um, it, I think a, a little known fact about uh, this commencement ceremony though is uh, some of the attendees, which I'll, I'll highlight here. Um, and it was an incredible day, which is actually, it was filled with actually people that are um, from the compression forum. And um, there is a really great story behind that. None, none the least um, that we have, um, a new professor of sorts uh, is presented at the TV show uh, with Professor Richard Hendricks uh, landing at Stanford, which is a, an incredible uh, part of his journey. I uh, won't, won't spoil that for people if you haven't seen the end of the show and, and what that's all about. Um, but even in his, uh, his office, you can see that um, in the back, there's a, a whiteboard there and uh, there was incredible contributions there from <clears throat> once again, uh, members of the, uh, the Stanford Compression Forum. Um, so it was, a, it was a pretty cool day. Um, we even got a little um, mention for, um, for Huffman down there as well. And um, I, I think it represents the, the end of an incredible journey that we've been on, uh, starting first with the very first compression uh, forum that was now six years ago, which is incredible to think about. And, and there, for those of you who, who did not attend, it's just worth explaining that we very much had work together with Sahi to, to help where we could, and, and perhaps more importantly for the show, um, actually suggestions were, were given from luminaries like Jacob Sieve or um, some of the, the 
very learned attendees that came to actually pitch, as you can see here, uh, Mike and Alec, um, who are the showrunners of Silicon Valley, um, on exactly how compression could be uh, a more formidable part of the entire show. And um, in parallel, I, I gave a number of talks. Um, the, the second compression forum, I was able to talk a little bit about inclusivity and, and how we were bringing up some important discussions to have um, in Silicon Valley about the role, let's say in this case, of um, women in the workplace. Um, and then more recently, I was able to talk at the last Stanford Compression Forum workshop on the role of self-sovereign data integrity and storage, which is, is certainly a big part of um, my research now as I've been working on this. And, and we presented some really important concepts, which I, I think we now are in a position to do a lot more with, because essentially the vision of what we talked about with the show and what I'll be talking about today is, is really one and the same, which is looking at how we can remake the internet and thinking a little bit about how, yes, a fictitious television show like um, Silicon Valley might yet be an inspiration. Um, and, and indeed, we, we spent a lot of time working with folks like Zappi to, to think about how we could take, let's in this case, a fictional uh, uh, compression algorithm and, and move it into the real world. Um, and, and I think that the overlaps are really interesting. I'd say as a nice little coda about Middle Out um, was that you know, here is where Richard presented uh, Middle Out to the world. And, um, you know, these came directly from sketches. Um, I don't know if some, there, there are likely many people um, here who, who may have had direct experience with consultants of the show, like Denise or Dimitri or Doya or Mikhail. You know, it was, a, it was really a family effort here at Stanford. Um, I'll just mention, I think it's, I find it very interesting that, you know, if you look at where things ended, uh, specifically with Middle Out, there was actually an auction that was done at the end of the television show. And um, Richard's notes for that very compression algorithm of middle out um, ended up selling for uh, $2,000, <laughs> which is quite a remarkable thing if you think about our, our little sketches uh, turning into something that has that value. And I guess maybe the question is, is that it? Is what we've done obviously with humor and in this case here creating, I guess, some, some pieces of uh, monetary value is that really where middle out is ultimately going to take us? And um, I'll come back to a question that I asked in my very first talk at the Compression Forum, which asked kind of jokingly, but, but also seriously, could a TV show end up making the world a better place? And, and I'm here today to talk about how potentially that could very well be the case. And I want to talk to you about the Starling Framework for Data Integrity as a way of explaining what we're doing now, carrying on some of the legacy of the show, but then also inviting people here who are gathered experts on compression to help us address a, a really important opportunity. And, and maybe yet we, we could all work together to use the technology for a common good. So um, our agenda today is I'll cover a little bit about the case study and our framework and, um, and then share with you uh, what we've accomplished and an invitation for how we could work together. So let's start with the case study. The Starling Framework for Data Integrity came together through the joint efforts of the USC Shoah Foundation and Stanford's Department of Electrical Engineering. And we brought together industry as well as academics to look at how we could use advanced decentralized web technologies to help advance the cause of human rights. In this use case here, we start innocently enough with a photo that was published four years ago um, by Reuters on the Newswire. And it's a combination photo, which basically shows on the right-hand side, the inauguration of Barack Obama's, and the crowd that attended his inauguration. And then on the left-hand side, you have the inauguration of Donald Trump. The caption that read beneath the photo stated factually that what was going on here. The photo itself was taken from essentially the exact same position um, in those two years. And um, it was also something that um, was very carefully timed to ensure that they were taking photos at roughly speaking the same time of the inauguration. And yet what should be a straightforward statement of fact ended up being a tremendous controversy. The Trump administration on its very first day in office, a full day in office, spent an inordinate amount of time claiming that photographs like the one I showed you 
or the other news coverage that was done um, at the inauguration was somehow manipulated or faked. President Trump used his first address um, to talk about how he was with an ongoing war with the media and specifically highlighted how the media was manipulating imagery to somehow downplay what was an unprecedented crowd size. Uh, his press secretary then spent his entire first press engagement disputing the validity of those types of footage and photos and in fact presented some alternate photos which later uh, that weekend was referred to by one of the president's advisors as alternate facts, alternative facts. Well, this time around, um, Reuters, who indeed took the photo the first time, wanted to see if we could spend extra effort to see how we could ensure the integrity of the photos taken from the Biden inauguration. And so we spent time working with Reuters over the course of a year, piloting a variety of different technologies that if you think about it, they follow the traditional signal flow of how you go about taking and publishing photos, which is you capture the photo, you store the photo, and then finally you verify it. You essentially have human editors provide captions and augmentation to then present it out as fact from the Reuters Newswire. So our framework that we developed is as much about the technologies as well as best practices. And our signal flow is open source. We had a root of trust in the hardware. We're using the latest Web3 protocols, and ultimately this represents what we think of as the next generation of decentralized technologies. So let me show you a little bit about how it works. This is the mobile phone that we were using. It's very similar to any mobile phone that's in uh, people's pockets in the audience. And in it, you have obviously a variety of data that the mobile phone is able to collect, not just the imagery that's coming from the camera, but also things like GPS, network data, the gyroscope, time and date, et cetera. Well, all of those um, sensors provide information and we put it into a packet and then marry that packet of metadata with, of course, the image. Together, that image and metadata package is hashed and then we sign it on a secure enclave um, that sits actually uh, with instructions and firmware that reside IO outside of iOS and Android. And this for us was an extra level of support to know that we actually had a root of trust in hardware for the image that we could trust. That encrypted file then is able to be distributed and we put it uh, with a unique identifier. Um, we essentially fragment it and put it out on the decentralized web where it can reside on the commercial cloud where it typically resides, but then also on things like nonprofits clouds or academics clouds or even a mobile phone or a laptop. The idea there is that the more diverse the storage, the more resilient it is. At the same time, we want to ensure that this file still retains its integrity. So we use protocols like Filecoin to initialize storage and basically seal those files using stepped up robust graphs to create a proof of replication. And then periodically we use the protocol to create proofs of space time that selectively take a random leaf node and then they encode a replica of the data and run Merkle inclusion proofs on them to demonstrate basically over time that nothing has been tampered with and the file has not been, uh, has not degraded in any way. So really, what does that mean? It means that actually you have a productive form of consensus and a blockchain ceiling because the more compute that's involved, the more people that are involved in this process, the more secure the file actually is. So that takes us through capture and storage. And then finally, for the last part of our work, we yet still want humans involved. And so the verification part of our framework is, we, is just as important as the others. And so as the image comes in and is reviewed by editors and looked at for um, to ensure that it retains the professional integrity that it needs to, the attestations of those editors and those fact checkers can yet also be certified and then put on a ledger itself that is decentralized. So really you have now webs of knowledge that are being created around the image that help give it context and also help certify its accuracy. So how do you present all of that information? Well, we worked with Adobe and uh, an initiative that they led through the Content Authenticity Initiative, which was a partnership with the New York Times and Twitter to take all of this incredible information that we have and to present it to end users in um, a new, interface that Adobe developed. So you can see here that a small glyph in the upper right-hand corner is presented, a little eye. And if the user clicks on it, 
they see an overlay. And in that overlay, they can see information about the photographer, the date in which the photograph was produced. Um, you can describe the activity, which in this case was a capture activity, and then also the location. Similarly, you can also go deeper to provide varying levels of um, authentication. So both the certificate of who actually signed this information, as well as the registration of all of this on the decentralized ledgers that I talked about. So the Filecoin CID, the IPFS CID, and um, rep uh, representations of the data, of the metadata on things like the Hedera hash graph and um, the gun network. So what does all this mean? Essentially, it boils down to a reimagining of the possibility of the photograph. Now the photo is not just a collection of pixels, but actually the photo is a container of all sorts of information that you can get that reflect not only metadata around the final image itself, but also can track over time any changes that were made to the photo. So you really have a chain of custody, think of it as provenance, it explains how the photo may have changed through legitimate reasons through an editing process. And all of that is then put together inside the photo itself. So that's the technology that we essentially integrated together. So how did we apply it? Um, working with Reuters, in, we decided that we wanted to look at the period from the 78 days following the election all the way up to the inauguration. And certainly we knew that those days would be charged and they would be difficult. And arriving on inauguration day, I think there was largely, I can speak of on behalf of many people, that there was a sense of relief that it arrived because certainly those 78 days were fraught and they were highly contentious and historically contentious. Um, the photographs that are in the archive, I think are a, a tremendous microcosm of the state of politics in the United States today. This should be a cause of concern for people on any side of the aisle, regardless of your political beliefs. In addition to that, they highlighted a disquieting trend, which was the role in which the anger that had been foisted um, from political disenfranchisement or political beliefs was really targeted at journalists, which um, I think was very um, symbolically and terrifyingly represented by um, the carving of murder the media on the Capitol doors. Um, after the January 6th insurrection. And I think that if you draw a straight line from where we began four years ago with the demonization of the press and the antagonism that was displayed to them, um, there is certainly I think, a deep breath that we all need to take to figure out how we can support journalists because journalism yet remains an important part of our democracy. And we cannot take that for granted. So the archive in a sense was using the technology to strengthen the cause um, of objective and accurate journalism. You can go to the archive at starlinglab.org slash 78 days. You can see the various photographs that were taken over that time period and you can click on the glyphs and you can see the metadata and basically a display of the technology that I've described to you here today. In retrospect, what we see with this information and really the opportunity with this technology is that it could address three fundamental challenges of our digital age. The first very plainly is, how can we secure the capture of digital photos? And this takes special um, significance when you think about the safety of journalists, which came into question during this time period. Unbelievably, the professional grade cameras that the photographers use, the professional photographers use, they're actually behind in the level of encryption and the security that they can provide photographers. Um, compared to, let's say, what's on your mobile device that has high levels of privacy and encryption um, of the kind that we talked about in, in our technology section, like the Secure Enclave. So certainly um, one of the big objectives remains to engage with the major OEMs to make sure that they can yet provide more tools to protect journalists and give them essentially at par uh, the technology that is available to any consumer. Um, secondly, uh, we really do need to think about the role of um, image integrity at source so that we can create a route of trust to deal with things like deep fakes, which is not yet an existential problem, but it is certainly a looming threat and requires discussion and preventative action in order to ensure that we can properly deal with authenticity in um, the new era of deep fakes where synthetic media is almost impossible to discern from real data. Secondly, we want to look at how you can securely store uh, digital images. And we've talked a little bit about the decentralized technology, 
And I think that was on grand display in those 78 days. Because when you look at the action that was taken to moderate content in the aftermath, let's say of the January 6th insurrection, the actions that were taken to remove hate and violence from social media were obviously welcome um, in many ways um, to help create more civics and more proper engagements around um, political discourse. Um, and yet at the same time, they also reveal the tremendous power of social media platforms to make those choices essentially unilaterally. And, and that is a cause of concern. Decentralized technologies present an alternative to that world. And so therefore the fact that we stored our imagery on decentralized networks is, is a powerful message to what could be. Then finally, we can ask the question, how do we verify digital photos? And I wanna focus the balance of my talk on this because it really is the invitation to this community here because there's a lot that we can do together to help. Well, the process of verification is very much a human process. E even if you're using forensic tools that automate certain parts of analysis, at the end of the day, you really do wanna have experts engage and for them to personally vouch for the authenticity of what is being um, asserted in the image. And in our process here, for instance, the creation of this composite, um, I personally took the two photos from the, um, uh, that were published through the original Reuters photo of the Obama and Trump inaugurations. And then I added the third photo, which was from the Biden um, inauguration. And in that process, in using Photoshop, I was able to record each step of my journey of importing those photos and composing them in a particular way. Um, and then all of that is retained within the file itself. So in a sense, that was my expertise in aligning these things properly within Photoshop that was then documented within the photograph itself. And this process of allowing experts of all kinds to join a process of consensus is critical because you really, the way to fight misinformation in the most resilient way is to have the majority of people come together in a platform that enables diversity. You don't want to centralize opinion. You don't want to centralize fact-checking. Instead, what you want is to create webs of knowledge that allow the, the maximum diversity within the system to come in and to provide different views of the authenticity. And it's really the consensus that is built through that diverse process that you ultimately get a more advanced understanding of what is going on. So if diversity is our project and we can think of the photo as an important locus for that, then really what we wanna do is take the chains of all of those attestations and carry them with the photograph. And that would allow for you to have within the photograph itself a form of internal validation to know that the photo hasn't been manipulated, the file hasn't been manipulated. You can then have embedded in the photo links to its registration on the decentralized networks, which we discussed, and thereby links to the preservation that can exist outside of the photo. And the way that Adobe does this is that they are using a new standard that they created called the Content Authenticity Initiative to place these various assertions uh, within the assets. Hashes are made at each step in that process and basically assertions are then supported by multiple claims about the image. For instance, it's time and place, whether it's been fact-checked, et cetera. That process can then be repeated as the photo endures various forms of travel and manipulation, et cetera. New attestations could be made as the photo's journey continues. And this is something that is interesting that we can have the metadata there, but what is critical is also providing a visual representation of this. So what I mean by that is in this tool that you can see here, we yet still want to allow for humans as end users to be able to see the journey of the photo and snapshots of the photo at each step in the process. So if you're following me here, what that means is that there are a bunch of images that are being created that are appended or embedded within the image itself. So we have, let's say, assertions one through three about the original photo, four and five made as the photo has changed, six as it's changed yet again, and maybe seven, eight, and nine as it is analyzed. And I think it should be plainly obvious to anyone here in this crowd that this is something that can create very bloated files. And I can speak from experience because as we built our prototype, indeed, it was a really tricky thing to see how the photos were growing as we were adding more and more assertions with them. 
So a couple of ideas that I offer out to the crowd. One thing that struck me as the non-engineer in this um, discussion is that there are some analogies that I can make that might be helpful to begin our discussion. The first of which is that if we think of a sequence of images that we see here, it's no different than let's say the sequence of images that might make a video, then really there could be ways in which we can look at P frames and B frames that work extremely well to describe, let's say the markers of difference between different video frames. Well, could we use that same type of strategy to look at the differences that are created with images as they evolve over time? Um, that's especially useful when you get into things like fact checking, because as more and more people continue to assert the, the validity of an image and that that image stops being changed and manipulated, well then really the compression is something that can um, really exponentially take off. And you essentially want that snapshot of the image to, to persist. You want the fact checking to be as expansive as possible. And one might ask, well, couldn't we just take those fact checks and just put them on the cloud? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be easier to just take them out of the image and then register them somewhere? And um, my charge to you all here is that uh, there's a beautiful opportunity to use compression to effectively solve this problem. Because if we can keep the image data within the image itself, the portability and the interoperability of that type of world is something that is really important. And you can reference my last talk to explain why philosophically that's, that's essential. Um, furthermore, um, one would argue that the, um, this process will also strengthen the cause of things like the new jump off standard, which the CAI standard uses. Um, it's something that Adobe chose this because it, it's really the only solution that works for JPEG. And so if we wanna work within the world that we have and strengthen the cause of image authentication with JPEGs, well, then this is really our best shot. And Jumbop has a couple of really important opportunities, not just for certifying information as we've described, but it can also do things like replace images so that you can obscure or potentially protect imagery um, in different ways as, um, as required. Um, so the security feature is really important. Um, and finally, I, I'll, I'll leave you with this idea, which is that by yet embedding intelligence within the file itself, you're really delivering on the promise of the internet. The idea behind the original design of the internet was of course to place power and intelligence at the edge of the network. And this was something that was you know, originally to deal with distributed communications that could survive, let's say um, a nuclear attack. Um, but the interesting thing here is that really the idea is that if things can get destroyed in the journey of let's say a photo moving through time, that there would yet be ways to ensure that each of the photos remain a universe in themselves that can ultimately arrive at its proper destination intact. One thinks of this as very similar to the way that network packets work within the internet, right? They have within them metadata and they have addresses of all kinds to ensure that they can move in an autonomous way. And, and I think that's a very useful analogy to think about how we might route for the truth. The reality is that we need to strengthen the cause of fact-checking and the work of journalists. And by just simply centralizing this into a single ledger of truth really limits the possibilities here. Um, so that's the opportunity. At the same time, uh, there are issues around redactions and corrections and clarifications. There are all the challenges around immutability uh, that everyone knows from the blockchain world. So compression is yet a really important part of this, but we still need to square it with other priorities as well. So really what this means is we need some hacking, some good old fashioned sit downs with engineers and the right folks to come together around the table and find a way to deal with this uh, issue. The team at Adobe I know is excited to have that conversation with us as a department and certainly all the people that are uh, attendees here um, are most welcome um, to have that conversation with us. Um, and that conversation will unfold over time into a variety of different projects. I'll just signal here for those who are interested and please feel free to reach out. Um, our journey with the Starling Lab is, is really just beginning in earnest. Um, and the next academic year will be our first full academic year of work. Um, we will be pursuing Web3 applications in the human rights domain for things like how we leverage 5G for authentication. We will be looking at authenticated video in addition to imagery, which we do today, end-to-end -end encryption with image authentication on mobile devices, and then also things like AI and 
applications like speech recognition that can provide various forms of, of verification, all sitting within this framework of a decentralized philosophy. So I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think we're running a little late, but um, I uh, just to say, most of all, um, thank you to Tzachi and the organizers. Um, I always really look forward to these forums and there's lots to be proud of and I look forward for the next ones to come. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for yet another inspiring and thought provoking talk. Um, as you said, we are running a bit late, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll just uh, sample a couple of questions if you could very briefly comment. Um, what stops people from messing with the met metadata? So how do you ensure that malicious tools don't manipulate the attached metadata, even when photos are manipulated? There are various hashes that are included in this process. And in theory, if there is tampering, it would be understood um, through um, basically comparing hashes along that process. And there's various forms of encryption uh, that are included in this as well. Um, part of what we do is we try to double up the work. So there's things that it can exist within the file. Those are the things that can exist externally um, in decentralized storage uh, ledgers. So I think reconciling all of those is, is really the answer. Um, it's by no means bulletproof, as we all know, in security. There's always room for um, attack and, and vulnerability. I'll leave my email address, though, Tzachi, in case anyone wants to get in touch um, and ask for more questions. I, I know you guys are running. Okay, thank you. There's a, um, okay, there was another question I thought to, um, you may want to briefly comment on, but I guess by Danielle, uh, but I'll apologize, Danielle, that um, I think we're just going to keep going to our next speaker.